You know, Jay and I, we don't confer. Jay doesn't confer with me before he adds his comments, but there really could not have been a more perfect opening to what I want to say this morning from the book of Acts as we begin, as we continue through this series, um, this, this unstoppable fire that was the church in the first century. Um, Jay talked about that bumper sticker he saw, and, and, and the way I wanted to lead off this morning, because we're with Paul, and he's in Corinth, and he's about ready to wrap up uh, what we call his second missionary journey. And, and I wanted to, to give us this morning uh, a review uh, of what Paul had been through. And this passage of Scripture came to my mind to open things up with today, and that's from 1 Corinthians. He is in the city of Corinth as, he's, as we are leaving him today. This is a letter he sent to them afterwards. And in chapter 1, starting at verse 18, he says this, For the word or the proclamation of the cross is nonsense to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the intellectual? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Do you know what that means? It means through our own understanding and by our own devices, we will not come to know God. We won't get there. Reason may take us a little bit of the way there, but it won't complete the journey for us. So God in his wisdom did not allow the world to know him through wisdom. It pleased God. <laughs> And then Paul gets ironic. It pleased God through the nonsense of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks, that's Gentiles or us, seek wisdom. But we preach, and Paul is referring to himself and his missionary companions, we preach or we proclaim Christ crucified. Now let me put it in language that would strike our ears a little more like crucified struck the ears of first century people. We preach Christ executed through lethal injection. A stumbling block to Jews and nonsense to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he talks to them directly. For consider your calling, brothers, these people in Corinth. <laughs> Not many of you were wise according to the standards of this earth. Rock Ridge Church, we don't have a lot of wise guys here. <laughs> well, we got wise guys. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment, Paul. You have anything else to say? Yeah, I do. Not many of you are powerful either. Not many of you are of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish. Oh, that's me, right? Yeah, that's you. <laughs> God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, crucifixion, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let no one who boasts, or let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, what is, why did I bring all of that in as we're wrapping up Paul's journey 
his second missionary journey. It's because of this. Both then and now, Paul didn't face bumper stickers with cross X'd out, but he faced philosophers. He faced, he faced a, a Jewish audience that wanted nothing to do with this message of a Messiah crucified. He faced the intelligentsia of his day in Athens, especially as we saw, who simply scoffed and mocked at him. What in the resurrection? You've got to be out of your mind, Paul. And yet Paul, if he wanted to deal with them in, in, their, in, in, in their capacity, in other words, if he had wanted to match wit and match intellectualism with them, he could have done that. Paul was an absolutely brilliant scholar, both in the Jewish world and the Gentile world. But he said, that's not how God reaches people. He reaches people through this message that no one wants to hear. That you need a Savior. And the Savior came, and he did something that you needed him to do, which was to die for you, because you're lost. And when you say that to a world that doesn't want anything to do with it, the first stance is usually, what do you mean I'm lost? I don't need no Savior. Right? I don't need no crosses. I don't need no rescuing. I'm fine. And so that is the natural response. But Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell won't stand against it. So as that message is proclaimed, Paul says in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Folks, i got to tell you, I spent an awful lot of my adult life trying to explain the gospel to people in ways that I think will be more palatable to them. But Paul says, you don't need to do that. Just present it. Because the gospel in and of itself has power. Because God's in it. And when we cease to believe that, we stop proclaiming it. Because we want to make it something that we think people are want to make it more palatable. But it, it is sort of silly, <laughs> isn't it? To tell people that they're lost, they need a Savior. The Savior came, that's good news. And he died for you. And somehow that forgave your sins. But Paul says that's the wisdom. And so this is what Paul has been doing now for three years at least on this journey. From A.D. 49 to A.D. 52, he went to places that did not know him, that did not know anything about this guy named Jesus, and he starts to proclaim this thing. And he usually starts with the Jewish people in their synagogues. Every now and then there'd be somebody there receptive, and Paul would pull him out, and then he'd, he'd go to the wider community, and he got, he got nothing but resistance. And yet, God was there. So we're in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 23. And so here we are. After this, that is after, his, after he was, uh, uh, after that stuff that Charles talked about last week where they tried to stop him, stop him again. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Cancari, he had his hair cut, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay uh, for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch, after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening the disciples. Now here's the point today. Despite constant opposition and persecution, Paul's second missionary journey succeeded in establishing Jesus' church on the European continent and influencing 2,000 years of world history. All right, I got a map for you, of course, again. This, this is his second journey. He started you know, in, Jer in Jerusalem, went up to Antioch, and then from there, he went to places he had been before in his first missionary journey, in present-day Turkey. 
Nothing going on in that region of the world today, is there? Right? Okay. And then he tried to go a couple different places, but it said the Spirit of God, and we'll get into that a little bit, ended up in this place called Troas on the coast, got this vision, a man from Macedonia, come over and help us, all right? And so he did. So they sailed there, and now, now instead of in Asia, he's in Europe. And he went to Philippi, and, and uh, then they went to Thessalonica and Berea, and then he ended up going to Athens for a while, and then he ended up in Corinth, all right? And then from Corinth, the journey that we just saw him, the, the, this passage described, he went here to Cancrea, which is a port city, and uh, that's where they said he had his hair cut, and we'll get into why in a little bit. And then he went over here to Ephesus, which becomes huge in his third missionary journey. But he's only there for a little bit. And then he said, whoops, you like that, don't you guys? Sorry. What? When the pastor steps in front of the speaker, the guys really love that. All right. There's a thing called feedback. You see, if the microphone is getting both my voice and the speaker's voice, you get feedback. All right. So, goes to Caesarea, and then, and then the passage says he went, he went up, but he really went south. Why would it say he went up, class? It didn't say Jerusalem in the passage, but that's the only explanation. Whenever you go to Jerusalem in the Bible, you're going up, even if you're going south. All right, because up is where the temple is, Temple Mount. So he went up, and then it says he went down, even though he went north. Okay, so he went north to Antioch, because again, it was in reference to the temple. So that's his journey. Now, l let me review just a little bit where Paul has been. His three-year adventure, all right? His companions were Silas, Timothy, and later on Luke, and then as we saw here, Aquila and Priscilla, so he picked up friends along the way. He started out with who? Just one guy. Who was it? Well, it was Barnabas before, but on this journey, who did he start with? Silas. Remember, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement, right, on whether to take a guy named John Mark with him on this one. And Paul said, he ain't coming because he, he abandoned us last time, and Barnabas said, I want him to come. He's my nephew. <laughs> Actually, he's his cousin. And, and, he, and he said, no, he's not coming. Yes, he is coming. And so you got to, and, and Luke described they had a sharp disagreement. Barnabas concerned with the individual, Paul concerned with the task. And so I think that even though it was a disagreement, they amicably split, and, and, and uh, Barnabas hung with, hung with John Mark, who later became the writer of the Gospel of Mark. Imagine if Barnabas had abandoned him, but he didn't. And also imagine if Paul had abandoned his work. God's wisdom coming into play here, right? Even through a disagreement. And so, Paul goes and he takes Silas with him, and then he picks up Timothy. So he started only with Silas, who replaced Barnabas. By the way, I think there's an application here. Never do ministry alone. In, in the New Testament, you always, always, always see Paul or whoever it is they're, they're going in teams. They're not, they're not doing this solo. They're not doing, there's accountability. There, there is, is power in teams rather than just an individual. We, we kind of think of the gospel as an individual deal. You know, we're going to individually. It's better done in groups, home groups, life groups, missional communities, whatever you want to call it. Evangelism is best done in groups. Why? Well, because there's something about Christians together and as we bring as we bring people who are outside the faith into these loving communities, that communicates something we cannot do by ourselves. That's why it's important to be together and to, to experience life together. And so he takes Silas with him, and they go, and then they recruit Timothy uh, in Turkey, in, in, in the first two places he went, Lystra and Derby. Later on, Luke joins them in Troas. How do we know that Luke joined them? Well, because in the middle of the passage... It, it, uh, it, Luke had been writing they, 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 and then all of a sudden Luke, the writer of Acts, writes we. So we sailed here. We did this. So he's now with them for a while. He goes with them apparently to Philippi because after Philippi, then it's, it's to they again. So, so Luke was with them for a time. Key cities they visited, um, Lystra, Derby, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Pas pointed out some of those 
uh, in the map. Miles traveled. Okay, over, over a three-year period, understanding he was a year and a half in Corinth, not traveling. So on a year and a half period, they covered 2,700 miles. Now, we drove to Minnesota in October. Our daughter lives there, and so we drove to Minnesota and back. And, and going to Minnesota one way is about 2,000 miles. And then, of course, we have to come back. Fourth, that's by car. All right? They're traveling by foot, and they're traveling by ship. 2,700 miles. 1,290 miles by sea. 1,410 miles by land. We overlooked that. Travel was not easy. Paul was not wealthy. He didn't travel in the most comfortable ways. Didn't fly first class. Didn't fly first class. <laughs> he was stuck back in coach, man. They weren't even serving him drinks. <laughs> Key people that Paul reached, or that God reached through Paul in his journey, Timothy, a woman named Lydia in Philippi, the first convert on the European continent was a woman, a businesswoman, Lydia. The Philippian jailer and his family. Uh, in Thessalonica, a guy named Jason and Aristarchus and Dionysius and Damaris, and then in Corinth, Aquila, Priscilla, Titius Justus, and Crispus, not names you're going to name your kids today unless you don't like them, but, <laughs> but names that are, that, are, that are included here in Scripture. <laughs> it said that, that uh, the reason Christianity won in the Roman Empire is today we name our dogs Brutus and we name our children Paul, <laughs> right? So there you go. Number of times Paul was imprisoned on this journey, one, in Philippi. Why? Well, because he had the temerity to cast a demon out of a servant girl, and it messed up the business for the guy that owned him, owned her, rather. Number of times beaten, one, in Philippi. Why? For casting out the demon. They beat him first and then threw him in jail. And one, it, it, we overlooked the severity of those beatings, too. Threatened with physical harm or legal action four times in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Athens, and in Corinth. The legacy of the journey, as I said, he influenced 2,000 years of Western history here. Listen to this. I got from a, uh, from a website on, early, on the early church. Paul's message went to these, pla these really unlikely places. Again, these, these people on the earth, they, they hadn't heard about Jesus. I mean... They're in, they're in Turkey, and, and they're, in, they're in Greece and Macedonia. Jesus was in Israel, across the Mediterranean a little bit. This new thing called Christianity wasn't traveling except through Paul. So they knew about Judaism, but they didn't know about, about Jesus. But he's, but he's making converts, and they are forming themselves into this thing called the church. Listen to this. The early, how did, and so the question is, how did it spread if it had nothing going for it? The earliest Christians did not have church buildings. Yeah! <laughs> I'm feeling you, right? I, we understand. No church building. They typically met in homes. The, or tents. The first actual church building to be found, as far as we know, is in a place called Dura Europas on the Euphrates River, built sometime around 231 A.D. So in other words, the first two, two and a half centuries, Christianity, there were no buildings. They did not have public, I was going to say public restrooms, they probably had those. They did not have public ceremonies that would introduce them to the public. They had no access to mass media of their day. So how can we account for their steady and diverse expansion over the first three centuries of Christian history? After the Apostle Paul, who, let's see, is a superstar, right? After the Apostle Paul, we do not run across many big names as missionaries in the first few hundred years. We don't hear of a lot of other people going out and doing what Paul did in the first three centuries. So how did it spread? Instead, the faith spread through a multitude, and I hope this encourages you today, it does me, through a multitude of humble, ordinary believers whose names have been long forgotten. In other words, these churches that Paul formed, these people met 
in their homes and in communities, and somehow this message of the gospel, which was absolute nonsense to most Greek people, Greek-speaking people, and a, and a total stumbling block to Jewish people because you're telling a Jewish people your Messiah died on a cross, your Messiah was executed. No, he wasn't. That can't happen to Messiah. You're absolutely insane. How does it, it spread through these ordinary people doing what they do? Early Christianity was primarily an urban faith. You notice that Paul went not to countryside places. He went to urban centers. So if Paul were here today, he'd probably go to downtown L.A. He'd go to Manhattan. He'd go to influential cultural centers in urban settings, which is what he did. And it spread through that. It established itself in city centers of the Roman Empire. Most of the people lived close together in crowded tenements. When we say houses and homes, what do we think of? Well, we think of nice landscaped areas and, you know, the single-family dwellings, right? That's what we think of. But in the first century, I wasn't. You are right on, think more like apartments or flats or, or very, um, very dense housing populace. So, so you're living right next to people and on top of people and things like that. All right, and that's where these Christians were living. They lived close together. They lived in crowded places. There were few secrets in such a setting. You know, have anybody ever seen the, the movie Rear Window? With J Jimmy Stewart's in it, and he's kind of spying on his name, and he, and he thinks this one guy has, had murdered his wife, right? And so, but everything in that apartment building is known by everybody else. There are no secrets. No secrets. The faith spread as neighbors saw believers' lives up close on a daily basis. Up close on a daily basis. What kind of lives did they lead? Well, Justin Martyr, an early Christian writer, by the way, the word martyr is because he was martyred. Martyr means witness, by the way. Justin Martyr, a noted early Christian theologian, wrote to Emperor Antonius Pius and described the believers. He says this, We formerly rejoiced in uncleanness of life. In other words, we lived just like everybody else did. But now... We love only chastity. He's speaking sexually here. We were, we were out there. But now we've seen the value of chastity. Before we used the magic arts, but now we dedicate ourselves to the true and unbegotten God. Before we loved money and possessions more than anything, but now we share what we have and to everyone who is in need. Before, we hated one another and killed one another and would not eat with those of another race. But now, since the manifestation of Christ, we have come to a common life and pray for our enemies, as the Lord prompted Jay to do, and try to win over those who hate us without just cause. In another place, Justin points out how those opposed to Christianity were sometimes won over as they saw the consistency in the lives of believers, noting their extraordinary forbearance when cheated and their honesty in business dealings. When Emperor Julian, who was called Julian the Apostate, by Christ, because he was an apostate, what does that mean? Somebody who absolutely does not believe wanted to revive pagan religion in the early 300s. In other words, let's, get the, let's reinforce the Greek and Roman gods in our culture. They're really who we're about. So Zeus, Jupiter, Mercury, those give, we want a resurgence of that kind of worship. He wanted to revive pagan religion in the early 300s. He gave a most helpful insight into how the church spread. This opponent of the faith said this, that Christianity has... has Specially advanced through what? Through the loving service rendered to strangers through their care of the burial of the dead. Something as simple as that. It is a scandal, Julian says, that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar. Why? Because, well, the Christians identified with them. And the Jewish people themselves had. And that the Christians care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help 
that we should render them. And you, you trace the history of hospitals and, and, frankly, service organizations and care organizations, and it has roots in the Christian faith, going back to the third century. That's how Christianity spread. Paul got it going, but the influence of that was not by famous people, but people who not even mentioned in history. On the surface, the early Christians appeared powerless and weak. They were an easy target for scorn and ridicule. They had no great financial resources, no buildings, no social status, no government approval. And, and we, we start whining when we think government isn't approving of us anymore. Man, they had more than non-approval. They had direct opposition. And it may be coming here too. But the knee-jerk reaction that we have is, as Jay said, is hate and strike back. How dare you? The reaction of these people was to pray and love and care for. Why? Because Jesus said, you've heard it say, love your friends and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And as people did that, Lives were changed. Some people died for it. I'm reading a biography right now of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was killed by the Nazis. He himself is a German. He is one of the few theologians who opposed what was going on in Germany, and eventually it cost him his life, and one of the most brilliant minds in the 20th century was ended at the age of 39. But it made a difference. What finally mattered is not what they didn't have, but what they did have. They had a faith. They had a fellowship. They had a new way of life. They had a confidence that their Lord was alive in heaven and guiding their daily lives. These were the important things, and it made all the difference in laying a Christian foundation for all of Western civilization. So the influence of Paul, of specifically this journey, I have another map. To show you. This represent this is done by Operation World, who keeps track of such things, Christianity. Uh, each dot, let me let me see what it is. each dot represents uh, fifty thousand Christians. Now now where did Christ Christianity started? Here, right? Jerusalem, Israel area. Spread here to Turkey. Not many there anymore, are there? Except on the coast, but look at the European continent. Now, these are self-proclaimed Christians. They may not be actual Christians, but this is more the influence of Christianity in culture. So Christianity went from here to here to here, spread. And then, of course, in the 17th, 18th, there's 15th, 16th centuries, it crossed the ocean. And then missionaries went out down here and around here and even to China. I can't get in front of it, but look, this is the west coast of China, where it's illegal. <laughs> this is the Philippines. Look at that. Korea, South Korea. It's amazing. Paul's missionary journey <laughs> started that. It, it's really miraculous when you look at it. All right. Some important spiritual points, applications from this journey. First, the first application is this. God directs while we move, <laughs> God directs. You've heard, it, you've heard it said that it's very difficult to guide an object which is standing still, right? Before, and anybody ever, I'm sure you have, because you, you guys, a lot of you are old like me. Driven a car without power steering? And you try to turn the wheel of a car that doesn't have power steering? You kids are looking at me. <laughs> What's power steering, man? <laughs> Power steering, of course, driving a car without power steering or a truck, in my case, my dad's gardening truck, which he never, never aligned either, so I'd get to 40 miles an hour and the thing would be like that. <laughs> driving a car without power steering, is if, driving a car that's not moving without power steering is nearly impossible. Okay, when a car's moving, now you can start to direct it. A lot of times... We get paralyzed, and we're trying to figure out God's will for our lives, and we're not moving at all. And God's saying, get going, and as you go, I'll direct you. <laughs> all right? Just go. Do something, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure you don't really mess up badly if you listen to me. 
So get going. Paul knew what his job was. He got going. And while he was going, we see in passage after passage, and especially a couple here uh, in Acts, that God directed him while he moved. Specifically, I uh, want to go back to Acts 16, uh, verses 6 through 9, as they're traveling through the area of Turkey, all right, the very beginning of the journey. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Again, he had been there before, ministering to churches that he, that he founded in his first missionary journey. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, which which would have been uh, a little south. Uh, and then they went up to Mycenae. They attempted to go into Bithynia, which had been to the north, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. That was that place on the coast of, of Turkey, western part of Turkey. And a vision appeared to Paul at night. A man from Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. I don't know if he talked like Mr. Bill or Mickey Mouse. But he heard that. He saw it and he heard it. Um, Erwin Lutzer, who is the president of Moody Bible Institute, tells a story. He says, a deeply spiritual, though misinformed missionary, I know, used to pray for special guidance about the most trivial matters. She would even try to decide whether it was God's will that she wash her hair on a given evening. You ever known people like that? Does God want me to do this? She was right in understanding that God is interested in the mundane affairs of life. God is interested in that stuff. But she was wrong in believing that she always needed a special sign. Obviously, she was a mental wreck. <laughs> she never knew if she was doing the right thing or not. And so, therefore, sometimes she didn't do anything. She did not realize that the will of God is simply living in obedience to whatever lies ahead. His guidance is not mysterious. In short, if your hair needs washing, wash it. That's God's will. You got dirty hair. Wash it. God's way becomes clear when we start walking in it. Translated, that means that we probably won't get direction from God until we start doing what He's already told us to do. Basically, what is that, class? Go make disciples of all nations. You will be my witnesses. Love God, love one another. Okay, those are, those are pretty clear, right? I, it's not difficult. Go make disciples. Be my witnesses, love God, love others, and serve. As we start to do that, I mean really start to do it and pretend that the Bible really is interested in, and is really speaking truth to us and it really is God's voice to us, as we start doing the very simple things, but yet hard, that he tells us to do, direction comes. Man, we can sit around... Any, now, I, I understand the need for meetings, right? In any organization, you have to have meetings. But meetings can be good or bad based on what? What happens in between them, <laughs> right? And, and if there's action plans called for and the action isn't done and then you get together again, well, you're, you're kind of stuck where, where you were. And so you've got to go back and, okay, what do we do? Well, do what we said last time. In a sense, it's kind of like preaching on a Sunday morning. Well, go do this, and then we'll move on to the next one, right? Love God. Love others. Make disciples. Be my witnesses. As we do that, we're going to get direction from God. He won't fail. Secondly, making disciples will always be difficult. I didn't say that God gave us something easy to do. Making disciples will always be difficult, but God will always be faithful to his promises. There's three passages I want to go to, and hopefully rather quickly here, but I, don't, but I want to give them, do them justice too. I want, I, I want to show you what describes both the discipleship process as Paul understood it, and the difficulty and the burden that Paul felt for those who came to faith through his ministry, and yet despite the difficulty, God was faithful and the church grew. And as we go to these passages, I want, I want you to see them with eyes that are not just seeing what Paul said, but in your own experience. 
of both being a disciple and, and helping others become better followers of Jesus. The first passage is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Colossae was on the west coast of Turkey. Paul hadn't been there yet, but he will be later through Ephesus. And so he writes to this church. He says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Heard about what, by the way? Heard about their faith and love which, and, and their hope, which is in the earlier verses. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, folks, there's all kinds of participles in that passage. And some participles are dependent on verbs and other participles. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me break it down a little bit because that's kind of important. But let me ask you this question first. Do you think there were people in Colossae who were sick? Christians. Do you think there were people in Colossae who were old and frail? Christians. Do you think there were people in Colossae who really, really needed some financial help? Absolutely. Absolutely. And Paul isn't saying don't pray for those things, but look what he prays for. Okay. This is Paul praying for them. These were, these were his people, in a sense. And this prayer is the prayer of a discipler, one who is concerned with the spiritual well-being and progress of someone else. First, we notice that he prays. <laughs> we, can, we can often overlook that. But this whole thing is Paul saying, here's how I pray for you. Paul prayed, and apparently he prayed all the time, every day. Second, his requests for them are these. So when Paul prayed, what did he pray for? Well, first, he prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God in wisdom and understanding. Filled with the knowledge of the will of God. And what does that mean? know what God wants them to do, okay? And that they would, they would know it, they'd have some wisdom and, and discernment in it. So that, why? What's the purpose? That, that little phrase, so that, is important. It's, okay, you're having a meeting. Why are you having the meeting? The meeting is so that we can make phone calls, do whatever, afterwards, all right? Have a plan. So he says, I want you to know what God's will is for this purpose, one, I want, I, I, want you to be, I want your lives to be pleasing to the Lord and bearing fruit. What is that? How? Well, in every good work. In other words, Paul is saying, in your communities, get on with it. I want you to know, I want you to know the, have knowledge of the will of God, and that will be found by being involved in good works in the name of Jesus in your community. That's how you're going to know what the will of God is for you. So in other words, you already know that to be true. Jesus said so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father. We know that we're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works, right? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And so Paul says you'll know the will of God as you begin to do this stuff, all right? So that your life will be pleasing and bearing fruit. The fruit comes in every good work. And... Now, this is really something. So that you will increase in the knowledge of God. Now, I want you to notice something here that we might not notice otherwise, unless you are really into diagramming sentences, which unfortunately I am. That's a dependent clause in this passage. What does a dependent clause mean? Well, it means it's dependent on what came before it. It's not one by itself something else defines it. And so he says, when, 
I, I'm praying for you so that you know that, that you'll know God's will, so that you can be pleasing to Him, and also so that you will increase in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of the Lord is accomplished by knowing His will and then doing His will. In other words, if I can put it this way, terms that we can understand better, it starts, it starts, doesn't finish with, it starts with knowing Scripture. Now some of you, you just need to stop right there, you need to get into the Word of God and begin to know it, because you don't. And you can't possibly get to the next step until you know it. It's valuable. Know Scripture, but it ends with doing Scripture. That is how knowledge of God is achieved. You will know more about Him as you, as you read, as you hear, but then something else happens as you do. You begin to experience God in real life situations. You begin to experience Him as you experience a friend. You begin to be able to predict some things that God will do and will not do, frankly, because you know Him. And that's what Paul prays for, for them. And then another request that he has is that they will be strengthened with all power. What kind of power? Well, according to the Lord's glorious might, not my glorious might or your glorious might, as glorious and as mighty as it may be. According to God's glorious might. And by the way, God's glorious might might be worked out in ways that look really weak. One of the greatest examples I can think of this, and, and, and it, it, it fascinated me at the time. Sometime in the 80s, or maybe it was, no, it was the 90s, early 90s, Mother Teresa, you remember Mother Teresa of Calcutta, little four-foot-nothing woman who just decided she was going to go to India and reach out to these people that nobody wanted to touch. She comes to the United States. And, and she comes before Congress at a time when Americans were saying it's okay to abort babies and throw lives away, which we still do, by the way. And Mother Teresa, this little four-foot nothing, weak, towards the end of her life, and all the power of the United States government behind her said, there are no unwanted children. Bring them to me. We will take care of them. Stop killing them. I, and that image of this little nothing woman kind of sticking it to <laughs> the rest of this Western culture was absolutely astounding to me. That's the way God does stuff through people that nobody else think matter. It's amazing, isn't it? This weak little woman <laughs> who ended up being the strongest person in the room. That kind of strength. The result of being strengthened with this glorious might is endurance and patience accompanied by joy and thanksgiving. So I'm almost out of time. i got to move. This is Paul's prayer for them, and through them it's his prayer for you and I too. So whatever our physical condition, our financial condition, or whatever, Paul's prayer for us is not primarily that those conditions will be averted, but that through those conditions we might learn something about God and serve him in them. Of course we want relief from pain. Of course we want healing from illnesses in, in God's will. But that's not primarily what Paul is praying for. Why? Because, folks, I don't know if you know this, we all die. <laughs> None of us get out of this alive unless Jesus comes first and we get raptured out, which would be kind of cool. But we all die. The difference is how we go about it. Right? As believers. And how we go through this process of life. Second passage is Colossians 1, 28 through 29. It says this, Him, who is Him? Jesus. Jesus. That's an easy one. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works in me. Discipleship, first and foremost, is all about Christ. It is all about Christ. It's not about anybody else. It's all about Jesus. Paul says, Him we proclaim. George Whitfield, a great 18th century preacher, said, Other men may preach the gospel better than I, but no man can preach a better gospel. Paul says, I I'm warning and teaching. 
In this biography I'm reading about Bonhoeffer, the preaching of, he says this, the preaching of grace can only be protected by the preaching of repentance. And he says this, Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And he was saying that at a time when the church in Germany and other places outside of Germany were capitulating to this guy named Hitler. Why? Because they weren't solid in Jesus. The bottom line, Paul says, is to present everyone mature in Christ. Now the overseers, we went through that passage and we... We, we broke that down. Who is Paul presenting people to here? To God or, or to Jesus, right? Presenting, presenting everyone, assuming here he's presenting, it's like, you're, okay, I'm going to take somebody, Michael. I'm going to say, God, here's Michael. He's complete. He's, I've, I've worked with him, man. I'm proud of him. And, 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 and he's going go, to grow up and he's going to go. He's already grown up, a lot taller than I am. He's going to mature in life. That's, that's what that means. Take, taking people, presenting them to God. Lord, you, 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 you presented this person to me and I, I've tried to be faithful to work with this person or individual and give them back to you. Present them complete or mature in Christ. Now, now listen to what he says next. First of all, this endeavor, this discipleship stuff took everything that Paul had. That's why I say it's not easy. He says this, for this, what, what is this? Presenting people to God, okay, complete and mature. For this, I toil. Now, what is the word toil? What, what kind of images come into your mind? Well, just hear the English word. What is it? Share? Work. Hard work. It, it, and, and that's the Greek word too. That's why we use toil. <laughs> it is work to the point of exhaustion. It's the kind of work you do and you come home you say, oh, right? You're dead on your feet. So Paul says, I toil. I work to the point of exhaustion. That doesn't sound like somebody who's, well, it's just up to God. I guess I don't have anything to do here. Right? He toils. And then he says, I struggle. This is a, a, the Greek word. I'm going to tell you this because it matters. Agonitsmenos. That's pretty impressive. What English word do you think comes from that? Agony. So I work to the point of exhaustion and I am agonized. It means to contend, to give all, to leave nothing. There's going to be two playoff games today in the NFL, right? The players will say, man, I don't want to leave anything on the field. What does that mean? It means that after the game, I want to make sure that whether we win or lose, I will know that I've done everything I can do, that I put out full effort, and I didn't hold anything back. You can't become a disciple maker unless you are ready to have your heart broken. Because Satan inflicts pain on people, which is absolutely devastating. And he wants to stop that process. That's why it's hard. But as Tom Hanks said in the movie League of Their Own, it's supposed to be hard. The hard is what makes it good. If it were easy, everyone would do it. And unfortunately, in Christian circles, especially in 20 and 21st century, we have stopped making disciples precisely because it's hard. It's much easier to entertain. It is. Put on a show, people come. That's not first century discipleship. It's not first century Christianity. And frankly, it's never been any century Christianity. And then the third passage. Galatians 4, 16 through 20. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that 
you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. I don't have time to get into the, the whole context of this, but this is in Galatia. The legalizers had come there and said, Paul didn't share the whole thing with you. You've got to do this, this, and this. And guys, you've got to be you know, circumcised and all that. So Paul is writing back to them, and, he's, and, and I just want you to note the last part of that. He says, I am in the anguish of childbirth. Does that sound... Uh, how many women here have given birth? How many of you gave pain-free birth? <laughs> Assuming that you weren't dead in so much you couldn't feel anything, all right? I understand there's cesareans, they can knock you out. Okay. Our, our daughter Natalie was visiting with us, and she's pregnant. She just passed her third month. This, she and I didn't even in childbirth yet, but I heard her almost every morning go into the porcelain god <laughs> and bow down to it. <laughs> the poor thing, I mean, she was just sick. She was sick, you know? Childbirth, as blessed as it is, is painful. And so Paul is saying, man, I'm, I'm, the anguish that I feel in my soul for you is like that. Until what? Until Christ is formed in you. So all that is to say that when I tell myself and I tell you that this church is supposed to be about making disciples, making followers of Jesus, and being Jesus' witnesses, I, I'm not saying it in a casual way. I am saying here that it is hard to be a disciple and it is hard to make disciples, but it is simple in the command. And because it's hard, we want to run rings around it and do something else. Like the kid who was told, go clean your room and they mow the yard. <laughs> but God is in it. And if he's in it, that's where I want to be. And more than that, he's faithful. Jesus is building his church, as we saw. In Paul's case, after two years of toil and struggle, there were now churches in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Corinth, key places in the Roman Empire from which the gospel could take wings and one day dominate the empire. Absolutely astounding. But it didn't do it by force. It did it through simple people doing simple things continually and over time that won hearts and changed lives. That's what Paul had been doing for two years. Now I have more. <laughs> and it's from the passage directly. And I'm going to give you the answers just so you can fill it in. I don't even know if you have to fill them in anymore, do you? Applications from Acts 18, 18 through 23. First of all, Here's what Paul did in the passage that we read at the beginning. Always prepare for what comes next. As Paul ended his journey, he went to a place called Ephesus, and he stayed there for a while, and he spoke in the synagogue as he usually did, and the Jews there said, hey, stay here with us for a while, and he said, no, i got to go. So he went, and he went back to Jerusalem, he did all that, but he's preparing for what came next. He, he wanted to go back there. He had, an, he had a plan. Following Jesus, doing what he says, does not mean we don't plan and we don't anticipate. Paul had a plan. He wanted to come back to Ephesus, but he knew now wasn't the time to stay. Frankly, he was probably exhausted after three years, which is our next point. So again, let's look at the map real quick. I think it's next. Is it not? Yeah. So he went here, went to Cancria. Paul and it said he cut his hair there. And I know you don't care about that now, so I'm not even going to get into it. Then he went to Ephesus, which is, again, now the, back into Turkey. Ephesus was a really crucial city in the Roman Empire. If you, go the, if you go today, you see the ruins of first century Ephesus. So he went there, and as we're going to see, it's going to become really important to Paul's continued ministry, but not yet. <laughs> he's anticipating what he's planning what he's going to do. So it says that Paul stayed in Corinth a few days longer before he left, and we know that he stayed 18 months in, in Corinth, and then, then he went on. Then the passage says that he did all that, went to Cancri, and he came to Ephesus. Um, so he was planning for what came in. Second point is this. Serving God involves times of rest. You would think after what I just said, 
rest would not enter into the equation, but it does. I mean, when God created the heavens and the earth and he took six days, what did he do on the seventh? God rested. Making a point to you and I that there is a time for stopping, for regathering, getting our bearings, sharpening the saw, whatever terminology you want to put to it, to rest. We are not made to work unceasingly. We got to stop sometimes. So it said, when he landed in Caesarea and went up, he went to Jerusalem, greeted the church there, then he went down, or actually north, to Antioch. That's where he came from, right? That was Paul's home church, Antioch. And after spending some time there, then he departed and he started another journey, which you will be hearing in the coming weeks. So I already showed you where he went. But I want you to stop and think that he spent, he, it says he stopped and spent some time there. The passage that came to my mind was this, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Jesus speaking, Come unto me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in spirit, you will find rest for your souls. Notice this is not an undisciplined rest that Jesus offers. The rest requires some things. First, it requires coming to him. If you think you're going to find rest by chasing other things, even the greatest vacation ever, which is good, but it's not really the kind of rest that Jesus is talking about. It is the rest that comes with contentment. It is the rest that comes with knowing you've done a good job. It's the rest that comes with knowing you're in the right place. You can go on the greatest vacation ever, but your mind is someplace else, right? You're not resting. This is the rest that Jesus offers. Come to me. And man, we want to go every place but him, even as believers. Seeking that elusive rest. Jesus says it's with me. Secondly, take my yoke. What's a yoke? All right, none of you are, well, maybe some of you are farmers. It's, yeah, I mean, you're probably not using oxen. Okay, a yoke is something you put on oxen so that they would do what you wanted them to do, right? Go straight so that one ox isn't going that way and another that way. It's a burden. It's, it's, it's a yoke. It's on your shoulders. But Jesus says, take my yoke. You're going to find my yoke different. First of all, you're going to find it fits. It's well suited to you. And you're not going to find that I can't be pleased. Any of you ever work for a boss that cannot be pleased? <laughs> Tell me about how that works for you. I'll tell you what, sometimes I talk to Christians and I wonder if Jesus has ever said anything kind to them at all. Because they're always under this sense of, God, that's not coming from Jesus. He's saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, there is rest with me. And if you're not experiencing that rest with him, which is, which is a, a, a shalom, a peace, you're not experiencing him, you're experiencing something else. My, burden, my yoke is easy, my burden is is light. The assumption here is that the demands of discipleship, that in those demands there are seasons of rest. There are seasons just to stop. And it's a good rest. It's a satisfying rest. It's the kind of rest you experience after a long, productive day of work, and you're exhausted, and you have a warm, satisfying dinner, and you sit down and rest. The kind of rest would not be satisfying without the work that preceded it. And that's what Jesus calls us to. As the band comes up, and I'm sorry, I went way long, but I haven't preached in a few weeks, so there you go. <laughs> Here's the next step with all of this. And, and if I could sum it up again, I would sum it up by saying, let's do what we know we're supposed to do. And let's not get distracted with ends around. Jesus says, go make disciples. Be my witnesses. We've seen 
that this is best done in community. Let's get on with it. Life groups, get on with it. Don't just study the Bible. Go do it. Any other group in our church, ministry is done by bands of people getting together and doing something, and as they do it, experiencing the direction of Jesus. It doesn't take, and it doesn't require, a lot of centralized organization to do this. It is just simply Christians living in community, reaching out to their neighbors and people around them in the job place, in the neighborhood, and making a difference. It's not complicated, but it is hard because there's lots of opposition. Let's pray for courage. Let's pray that we would truly love one another and that we would take God seriously. And as we go through Acts, we would not miss that this isn't just for the Apostle Paul. It's for us. Trust God to direct you while you do, while you do what you know he wants you to do. Always include times of rest from your spiritual service. Let's pray. Lord, this is a lot we've thrown out here today. We acknowledge that making disciples is hard. We acknowledge that if it were easy, everyone would do it. We also acknowledge and ask forgiveness for when we don't do it because it's hard. Where we get distracted and do other stuff that you really haven't asked us to do. And so, Lord, I pray that this year in 2017, we as a church would refocus like a laser on the very simple commands you've given to us, understanding that they are also hard, but that we would experience in this a deeper knowledge of you that comes from knowing your word and then simply doing what we find there. That as we desire a deeper walk with you, we would understand it doesn't just come through contemplation. It begins there and ends with doing it. Help us, Lord Jesus, because we are weak, but your spirit is strong, and you've given us your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand.